world premiere Crystal clear in your ear, so listen here Yeah, it's up new, but I ain't no new kid So don't fool yourself Now on Pick Up The Pace and also throughout the album A lot of it, you always mention or often mention Like your mind and your brain and all these different types of things So mm. that was something that I always thought was interesting because I always looked at rap and rappers as like a super elevated thing that takes a lot of brains and intelligence. So for you, why were you always like mentioning your brain or like the cosmos or these higher things that didn't get a lot of attention, I think? Um, I don't know. I like, you can't, you can't say some shit if, if it don't come from here. Like to me, like you, like, a motherfucker can't say what I'm gonna say because they're not thinking how I think. So you know, I don't know. I, it, it just it just happens. I, I just it's like it's no process to it. It just I do it. Okay. Whatever what I, I put on the beat, whatever I, whenever I get a beat, whatever that beat dictate dictates to me, <laughs> that's what I do. You know what I'm saying? Like one like a kind of beat might have like a a certain horn. It, 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 like suspenseful on, so you, you gotta tell a story. You know what I'm saying? Like whatever the beat dictates, that's what I do. Okay. Basically. And yeah. and something new was a, uh, a single and a big song for you. Mm -hmm. and the thing that always impressed me and shocked me was that by the time it's 1990, rap had broken through commercially or was starting to in a much different, bigger way than just a few people getting through like a run the MC or LL or Beastie Boys or whatever, Fat Boys. It was like a lot mm -hmm. of people getting through. Mm -hmm. What I also noticed was around this time, the stacking in the, the Kool Mo D, Kaz, Cool G Rap, Kane thing had kind of started to fade from singles, but mm -hmm. someone who has that, so, mm -hmm. especially in a second verse. So like strategically, uh, was that even a concern? Like, hey, I'm rapping too hard or too fast or stacking too many rhymes or too intricate or whatever? Or was it just, eh, this is the best song? Or nah, nah. Okay. And then like some, I, I, I see what you're saying though. Like some beats, it's like that. You're like, nah, it's, you can't go too hard on that because you know, it's, you're gonna fuck it up. You know what I'm saying? You could you out rap yourself, you know what I'm saying? For some reason, like, nah, chill out, relax. You know what I'm saying? But, Nah, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't feel that was a problem on something new. Okay, because uh, just a lot of the imagery too, like taking your pride like a stick stick up kid, like that. That's, up. that's yeah. such a amazing, amazing visual that <clears throat> I always uh, appreciate it because the the imagery that you have throughout the album, and we'll get to some of the other songs, is uh, is remarkable. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, as far as writing and poetry and was that also like all coming from the Spoonie G's and the Kumo D's too or is that something different? Um now when I started writing poetry it wasn't I mean I didn't there wasn't no hip hop at that time. You know what I'm saying? That's like for me it wasn't. I'm like probably like for nine, eight years years old or something, you know what I'm saying? Like early seventies or something. So I, I didn't know nothing about no hip hop. I just liked the poetry. But then when that shit came around, I, I noticed the difference between, say, like um, a group like the Phyllis Four, right? And they had DLB. DLB was the one that was like the cool Mo D of the Treasure Street to me. You know what I'm saying? Like the lyrical motherfucker. So that I, always, I always gravitated to lyrics. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, lyrically, one of the more interesting juxtapositions I thought was on Mass Destruction, where you're talking about all this death, chaos, madness, but then you have the sun, the moon, and the stars, and how they were going to fall from the sky, and all this stuff. Yeah. So um, what, how did you find, or how did you examine things from a cosmic level into your reps, like on that song in particular? Um. I don't even know, man. It just sound like what's to go on that beat. You know, the beat sound like some shit that I was saying. I should say this on this. This sound like it matched to this type of shit. It was. It was just that. A lot. A lot of people think like it, it's a lot of thought process that go into that shit. Nah, it's just not real. This is what it sound like. 
Like, so when, when I hear a beat, I'd be like, what type of shit sound like will go on here? This sound like some shit, like disaster striking or some shit. And then you just take it from there and start building it in your mind. Like, all right, that's it. <laughs> okay. And with the gals them so hot, that had the reggae vibe, which was very, yeah. very different, uh, almost incongruous to the rest of the album. So how sequencing wise, why did you put it there? And then just making it since it was so different, what was that about? The sequence, I didn't have nothing to do with the sequence. And that was, you know, the, the, the label and everybody else. I just made the songs, but you know, at, at that time, like reggae was like fucking super, super fucking hot. Um, so, and Shabba Ranks was had just broke with that. Um, uh, what joint he had with that beat? That's where we snatched that beat from a Shabba Ranks. I forgot what it was, but it was just it was just the shit at the time. You know, that was the hot shit to do at the time. So I did it. Okay, that's all. And then uh, part of the reason I was asking about the sequencing is because toward the second half of Smooth Assassin, the some more of the story rap type of things really came through and mm -hmm. nobody moved. I was uh, very intrigued about because one, it's a great, in my opinion, a great story. And it also shows uh, the best of what people look at as hardcore rap, street reporting, gangster rap, whatever you want to call it. But it shows the highs of the life, but then the lows yeah. of the life. So, yeah. So for you as a writer, how, what was important for you about showing the highs and the lows of, you know, someone that is engaged in robbing banks or robbing people? Right, I just, I, just, I didn't want to leave it as, we just got away with everything and shit was cool because it don't happen that way, you know what I'm saying? It's consequences to this shit, you know what I'm saying? You get away sometime, like in real life, <laughs> I got away sometime and I didn't get away sometime. So <laughs> I had to tell that, you know what I'm saying? I had to give it, give it everybody the real. Like you can't just say you did all this wild shit, you got away and everything was cool. Nah. Yeah. And I think that balance is important. So, you know, for for you as an artist, me as a listener, like I always understood that that so much of that was in so much of rap, but why do you think some people had a hard time recognizing that they might hear nobody move and be like, oh, he's glorifying robbery. robbery. But to me, I looked at it like, this is a cautionary tale because you, KC, everybody in the song is like, dead, yeah. getting locked up, whatever. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like, like I say, like a lot of motherfuckers going to play hero, they play Superman. You did all this shit and you never got caught. Or you never got beat. You had a hundred fights and you never got beat up. You never got a black eye or nothing. Like, come on, man. That shit's whack. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like every Mike Tyson got his ass whooped before. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? You can't you can't tell the Mike Tyson story and not put in the Buck Buster Douglas shit. That's that's a very important part of the story. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'll never forget. I was with my dad. We were driving back from one of my basketball games and I heard it on the radio. And I just, I literally thought it was like a prank or something. I was like, nah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, that shit shook up the world, man. What? Yes, it did. Um, so with, uh, speaking of looking at things, honestly, the Behind Bars song was a, mm -hmm. uh, interesting too because I don't think it had really started happening yet but sadly soon thereafter we had gotten a lot of uh I guess celebration per se of being incarcerated or the locked up mm. lifestyle or something yeah. and, and your song is diametrically opposed to that or the opposite of that really showing how to, how you got to navigate and different things and of course we had Rikers Island, Cool G Rap, and other songs that did similar things. Right. For you, for you, how and why did you pick uh, jail and, and stuff to talk about on Behind Bars? Cause I was like, that was my life at the time. You know what I'm saying? 
I had I had an open case when I when I got signed. You know what I mean? And it's like, and like you said, Coogee Rap had the Rikers Island. You know what I'm saying? I'm from I'm from Long Island. We had Nassau County. You know what I'm saying? So I I wanted I wanted them to know what it was like in Nassau County. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. And actually, actually, we we end up um using a a, a little uh, scratch off of um Coogee Rap. A movie Elvis like Pub was due to Jailhouse Rock because the, the original, the original scent that we had was the real Elvis. The Elvis Presley people said, "Hell no, <laughs> they wouldn't clear that shit for nothing." They're like, crazy, you not putting that shit on this? <laughs> Fuck out of here. Well, speaking of that, with the scratching, one of the many reasons I love Smooth Assassin also is because of the scratching and the sampling in the choruses, especially where there is lots of scratching. So mm -hmm. in 1990, sadly, in my opinion, this was starting to fade from records because of sampling and lawsuits and all kinds, yeah. of, all kinds of factors. But for you, you guys, why was that so important to put scratching on so much of Smooth Assassin? Because that's still a part of, you know I'm saying, one of the elements, man. You can't leave that out of hip hop. They, like today, you don't hear that shit hardly ever. Especially not on no mainstream shit, never. But you know, that they it's still a part of hip hop. It's one of the elements. How could you leave that out? No, well, I mean that's why Smooth Assassin, like I said, I love it because it has that element to it. And I think mm -hmm. the the late eighties into the very early nineties, we still had a lot of scratching. And I just think it adds so much creativity and the sonics of it. Mm -hmm. I, just always, I just always loved it, man. Um, That's why I love Premier Beats. Right. He always got the crazy scratch hook on there. Yep, one of the best ever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now, with uh, Sugar Free, that one mm -hmm. was much more R&B and like crossovery. So, mm -hmm. uh, creatively, what made you want to explore that when the rest of the album is so much darker and heavy as opposed to that one. Oh, cause I love R and B. Like I just, I, and I love that song actually. You know, I just, I had them replay that shit and everything. Had the whole shit replayed. Cause I like, that's why I, like at that time I was big on reggae, R and B, the old school show. Like all the elements on that album is me. Like what I was really, really into at that time. Okay. And, and the other thing that another thing that was very impressive to me about Smooth Assassin was that there were so many singles that actually came out. So mm -hmm. given that you weren't selling two, three million copies, uh, how and why did it end up to where you got to put out so many singles, do you think? Oh, because they knew the project was a good project. You know what I'm saying? And they, it's not my fault. They, they didn't, you know what I'm saying, uh, promote it or do what they were supposed to do with it properly. But the project was a strong project. It was like one of Ty's favorite projects. So at that time, they had um, Genius. And me and his album were like simultaneous kind of, but my they gave my project more attention. And that's why he got, he got, he got Vex behind that. That's why he said this shit on um, Protect Your Neck about, um, uh, what's that line he say? Wolves to uh, killing for these cold chilling labels. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Looking for a suit and tie rap that's cleaner than a bar of soap. Right. Who got the suit and tie on, on cold chilling? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's all good. I seen them, we talked about it. Okay. It wasn't. Fair enough. So then, yeah. um, as you, as the album was out, though, there were also different versions of the album, or at least different things, songs that would pop up here and there. Um, like mm. the shout outs was on the B side of this is a recording, for instance, and different things. So, yeah, I don't know why they did that dumb shit. I to me, that, why did. <laughs> That was stupid as hell. Why would you put a fucking shout out song as a B side? Hence my question to you, because I didn't get it. <laughs> I had I had no no fucking input in none of that shit. Okay. I wanted I wanted the first single to be nobody move. 
But um, Biz was like, nah, we gotta do this as a recording. And Biz and, and Fly Ty, they argued about that shit. And, you know, it was it was Biz production deal, so he got to choose. And he went with um he went with the uh this is a recording. I wanted nobody move, well, my brother wanted to use smooth. Be sure to check out the history of gangster rap by Soren Baker. He's official. History of gangster rap features exclusive interviews with Ice T, Snoop Dogg, MC Ren, the DOC, and dozens of others. The history of gangster rap, a definitive look at how Los Angeles changed rap forever. In Los Angeles, the streets definitely set the tone of the hip hop music. A 19, I got a $50,000 car. My whole angle always was I'll be street, but I will always tell you the horrors that go along with this life. It would be penalties and casualties for just wearing the wrong color in somebody's neighborhood. And once gangster rap made it from the streets to the TV, the genre exploded. What's that, five on your TV back Yo MTV it just catapulted us from being local heroes to national gangbang rappers. The history of gangster rap discusses it all from 1980 up till today. It's always gonna be shit happening in the streets. You know what I mean? So it's always going to be something to talk about. The history of gangster rap in stores now.